This is the second part of a two-part presentation on the chemical control of breathing. Part one discussed the role of carbon dioxide. This part will discuss the role of oxygen. The peripheral chemoreceptors are the primary site of respiratory response to hypoxemia. Although the aortic bodies may have some chemoreceptor function, the carotid bodies are the predominant peripheral site in controlling ventilation. The carotid bodies have a very high metabolic rate, but the blood flow is 10 times the level that would be consistent with their metabolic rate, so perfusion is extremely high. The glomus cells are the predominant cells in the carotid body. The glomus cells synapse with nerves from the glossopharyngeal nerve. The response time for carotid bodies is extremely short, within the range of one to three seconds. Notably, chronic hypoxia results in hyperplasia of the glomus or type one cells in the carotid bodies. This occurs even if the hypoxia is intermittent as occurs in patients with obstructive sleep apnea. The type two cells appear to be a source of the increased number of glomus cells. Note that the carotid bodies respond to a decrease in the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood, not the oxygen content of arterial blood. Accordingly, anemia, which has a much larger impact on oxygen content than a decrease in the partial pressure of oxygen, will not stimulate increased ventilation through this mechanism. Similarly, aberrant forms of hemoglobin, such as methemoglobin, which is the cause of the skin coloration of the blue fugates in eastern Kentucky with congenital methemoglobinemia, will not stimulate the carotid bodies through this mechanism. Acidemia stimulates the carotid bodies. The magnitude of the response is the same whether the etiology is metabolic or respiratory. Although the response time of carotid bodies is very short, the magnitude of the response to an increase in CO2 is dramatically less, about 15%, than that produced by the central chemoreceptors. It should also be noted that, unlike the linear response of the central chemoreceptors, the carotid bodies have a threshold. If the decrease in pH is less than the threshold, no stimulation of respiratory drive will occur. Hypoperfusion also stimulates the carotid bodies to increase ventilation. Have you ever noticed that patients with profound hypotension often have an increased minute ventilation? The mechanism is not clear, but most hypothesize that it is caused by a decrease in the partial pressure of oxygen due to stagnant hypoxia. Not only does an increase in body temperature result in increased ventilation mediated by the carotid bodies, but hyperthermia, even as modest as a one and a half degree centigrade increase in temperature, also amplifies the ventilatory response to both hypoxia and acidosis. Agents which block the cytochrome system, for example, cyanide and carbon monoxide, produce an increase in ventilation mediated by the peripheral chemoreceptors. Similarly, drugs which stimulate sympathetic ganglia, for example, nicotine and acetylcholine, are carotid body stimulants. This graph shows the effect of progressive hypoxia. Notice that there isn't much of an increase in minute ventilation until the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood is less than 60 millimeters of mercury. This may cause you to think that oxyhemoglobin saturation is the driver. That's incorrect. As previously stated, the driver is the partial pressure of oxygen. The effect of hypoxemia on respiratory drive is additive to the effect of hypercarbia. Note that for any given level of oxygenation, minute ventilation is higher in the presence of hypercarbia. This graph shows how hypoxic respiratory drive changes over time in two different conditions. With poikilocapnia, the subject's partial pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood is not controlled, so the increase in minute ventilation occurring due to hypoxia results in hypocarbia. The hypocarbia acts centrally to decrease minute ventilation. The end result is as you see here. The maximum acute increase in minute ventilation and the chronic increase in minute ventilation are modulated by the effects of the decreased arterial CO2. With isocapnia, the subject's partial pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood is maintained at a normal level by adding carbon dioxide to the inspired gas mixture. 
This graph clearly shows that if PCO2 is maintained at baseline values, much greater increases in ventilation occur. The difference between the two curves clearly indicates that the increase in ventilation occurring with hypoxia is attenuated by the reduction in ventilatory drive resulting from a decrease in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood. Obviously, the poikilocapnia curve more accurately reflects the clinical situation. For both curves, note that with the imposition of hypoxia, minute ventilation increases dramatically for 5 to 10 minutes. After about 5 to 10 minutes, minute ventilation starts to decline and reaches a plateau in 20 to 30 minutes. This decrease, termed hypoxic ventilatory decline, is proportional to the increase in minute ventilation. Stated another way, the greater the initial increase in minute ventilation, the greater the hypoxic ventilatory decline. It is not known why this phenomenon occurs. If hypoxia is sustained after the period of hypoxic ventilatory decline in isocapnic patients, that is, if the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood is maintained at a normal level, generally through inspired CO2, a period of increased ventilation will ensue. That increase will last at least eight hours. The timeline on this graph is even longer, extending to weeks and years. It demonstrates that over a period of one to two weeks, minute ventilation gradually increases. Naturally, this is accompanied by a decrease in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood. The new levels are sustained for years and become the, quote, normal, unquote, for subjects who spend their lives at high altitudes. We've looked at the impact of carbon dioxide on hypoxic respiratory drive. Now let's consider the effect of oxygen on the CO2 control of breathing. Remember the CO2 response curve from the prior presentation? The curve shows that a specific minute ventilation occurs for a given partial pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood. The second curve added to this graph shows the impact of hypoxia on the CO2 response curve. It's immediately evident that the curve is shifted to the left. As shown by the green line, this is manifested by the fact that the presence of hypoxia results in an increase in minute ventilation for any given partial pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood. Perhaps even more interesting is the fact that hyperoxia is actually a respiratory depressant, as indicated by the fact that the CO2 response curve is shifted slightly to the right in the presence of an arterial partial pressure of oxygen of 600 millimeters of mercury. This effectively indicates that even under normal circumstances, oxygen provides some part of the total respiratory drive. Ultimately then, the CO2 response curve is actually a family of curves which varies based on the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood. As indicated by this graph, the same thing happens with various conditions, including metabolic acidosis. Metabolic alkalosis presents an interesting phenomenon that demonstrates the integration of the oxygen and carbon dioxide drives to breathe. Metabolic alkalosis should result in decreased respiratory drive simply on the basis of increased pH. Why is there rarely a significant decrease in ventilation in patients with metabolic alkalosis? Remember that there is a reciprocal relationship between the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus. That is, if the partial pressure of carbon dioxide increases due to decreased minute ventilation, the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus decreases, resulting in a decreased partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. As that occurs, there will be an increase in the hypoxic respiratory drive, with the ultimate result that minute ventilation is not significantly reduced in most patients with a metabolic alkalosis. Now think about a child with pyloric stenosis. The child will have some degree of residual metabolic alkalosis when presenting for surgery. While a child may not be hypoventilating preoperatively, at the end of the case, while the child is breathing 100% oxygen during emergence, the hypoxic respiratory drive will be obliterated, allowing the depressant effect 
of metabolic alkalosis to become evident. This is most obvious in neonates, especially in those who are premature at birth, because the respiratory drive, including the carbon dioxide drive to breathe, is not mature. Although this graph relates to neonates, it still provides some useful information for adult control of breathing. Note that with the onset of asphyxia, there is an initial increase in respiratory rate manifested as gasping respirations. Over time, however, respiratory rate actually decreases to the point of apnea. As hypoxia persists, gasping respirations resume. Eventually, however, breathing ceases, resulting in what is known as terminal apnea. This phase is precipitated by the effect of hypoxia on the central respiratory centers. The respiratory depression due to hypoxia, sometimes termed central hypoxic depression of ventilation, also occurs in adults. In laboratory animals, ventilation ceases completely when the partial pressure of oxygen in the medulla is less than about 15 millimeters of mercury. This corresponds to the primary apnea in a neonate. If worsening hypoxia ensues, gasping respirations may resume. In summary, the carotid bodies, which are the most important peripheral chemoreceptors affecting respiratory drive, respond primarily to hypoxia as detected by the partial pressure of oxygen. Anemia and aberrant hemoglobin forms will not directly stimulate hypoxic drive through the carotid bodies, although resulting acidosis may have an impact. Hypercarbia amplifies the respiratory response to hypoxia. Acute hypoxia stimulates an increase in minute ventilation, which decreases over 20 to 30 minutes. In the short term, hypocarbia mitigates the increase in minute ventilation, but in the long term, weeks to years, chronic hypoxia results in increased minute ventilation with resulting hypocarbia. Hypoxia and hyperoxia have an impact on the CO2 response curve. Respiratory depression to the point of apnea occurs as a result of severe hypoxia of the central chemoreceptors. That's the end of this presentation on the effects of oxygen on the control of breathing. Thank you, and I hope you found this series educational.